Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's November 3rd, 2016. I'm your host, Owen Schroyer. Here's what's on the news tonight. Tonight. Election fraud, electronic voting machines, and the Clinton crime wave. How Hillary plans to steal the presidency from Donald Trump and the American people. Then, a Trump supporter who was tossed out of NBC's Today Show for wearing our Bill Clinton rape shirts is suing the network and their goon squads for damages. Plus, it's good versus evil. Why American Christians are choosing to vote for Donald Trump. Pastor Carl Gallup says it's not just a left versus right issue. It truly is Americanism versus globalism. The establishment elite, they are globalist, thoroughly through and through globalist. They don't give a rip about America. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, folks, we are just days away from the presidential election, and one of the biggest things on a lot of people's minds is the integrity of the results. Now, here at Infowars.com, we've been all over this, especially the electronic voting machines, whether it be Hart, Diebold, or Smartmatic. We've been looking at who's affiliated with these companies, where they're being uh, used in this election. And in a recent development, folks, now I've been to Smartmatic's website before. I've covered it on the nightly news even, but they have made a change to their website. Look at some of the claims that Smartmatic is now making on their website. This is surely in response to us and people like you. Facts about Smartmatic, because transparency is at the core of what we do. It is important the facts about us are well known, our origins and our work powering elections around the world. Now, if they were really for transparent elections, I think it's easy paper ballots, but that's not what Smartmatic does. They have gone as far as to clarify that George Soros does not have or has never had any ownership or stake in Smartmatic, and they even mention his ties with Chairman Lord Mark Malak Brown, very close ties with George Soros, runs the Smartmatic machines. Of course, Smartmatic just says he's highly respected. This is a highly respected global figure it's kind of like when cnn says james o'keefe is discredited they just throw these adjectives out there to confuse the general public and act like they're um, really on the lookout for their best interests smartmatic claims it will not be deploying its technology in any u.s county in the 2016 presidential election now this is very important because i've had people sending me pictures of what they claim is smartmatic machines at voting places now i cannot uh, clarify whether these are real or not but that's something that we ask you the info warrior to help us keep an eye on smartmatic claims they are not being used in this election let's keep an eye out for that but they do deny any ties to george soros however they do claim this and this is why we can't trust them that they have handled more than 3.7 billion votes without a single discrepancy that is not true folks here's one story U.S. investigates voting machines, Venezuela ties. The federal government is investigating the takeover last year of a leading American manufacturer of electronic voting systems by a small software company that has been linked to leftist Venezuelan government of, uh, that'd be Hugo Chavez, the former president, or I'm sorry, the communist president of Venezuela. So there have been discrepancies, Smartmatic. So right there, you lied. Why don't I believe you're telling the truth about the rest of those claims? But we'll find out just days away from the election. This is very important. Now, I bring in Margaret Howell to the studio. Now, you have been following um, a weird thing going on where what appears uh, people are preparing to announce a Hillary Clinton victory here. Well, OK, so Owen, we know she's diabolical. We know that she is shameless. We also know that our news director, our nightly news director, Rob Dew, was at Alex's house last night. They uncovered this uh, massive story. We're going to be bringing you more of this tonight. Uh, these pre-programmed graphics that have been ordered up from a company uh, that every major network is using. They have Hillary Clinton winning. 
uh, by just over a million votes eking through, and they've already plugged in the numbers. And it looks like, uh, you know, this backs up everything that Bev Harris has said, who is a Democrat, by the way, election fraud expert. She said Hillary's going to steal it, and here's how. Then she goes into fractional tabulation. We're going to be bringing you guys more on that. Uh, but it's amazing to look at this. Trump knew the system was rigged. He's been saying it in stops in Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania. And uh, we want to show you how they're doing it and producing these clearly fake results. People are coming out and saying, no, they're just tests. It's just a test. It's not a test. The way that this looks, uh, they're producing the election results, and it's, it's not a, quote, test. And basically, you decide nothing, that they already have this lockdown for her uh, with the numbers on the page already. That's yeah. the way it looks. And, and it's, I, I mean, it's normal to prepare for things and use graphics like this, but to have the results already planned out, that takes an extra level that uh, typically mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that they go to those legs. Uh, you, th you think? Uh, they look at, uh, now they haven't looked at, so just one example that I found, Wisconsin, a uh, major swing state, and supporters of Trump, they're passing around uh, voting totals, early voting totals. Uh, they purport to show Trump with uh, a lead, actually. They don't have Wisconsin in the bag for Trump. Trump's clearly leading in Wisconsin in the early voting uh, exit polls that we're looking at. This, uh, you know, pre-programmed graphic has her eking past with a number of percentage points. So it just goes to show you how corrupt this is multi-level. You couple that with the fractional tabulation. We have a system that pretty much looks like what Trump is saying it is. It's rigged, folks. Well, we have record voter turnout expected. Let's see if they try to rig this election. I'm joined now by Mark Gallagher and his lawyer, Richard Luthman. Now, Mark, you are apparently well known around the New York area, especially around Rockefeller Plaza, for being a Donald Trump supporter and a Bill Clinton rape protester. Tell me, when did you decide to go ahead and don the Bill as a rapist shirt and start your protest? You know, I heard uh, about the contest from one of my friends. He uh, said, you know, it's a great way to uh, earn some cash, pay off my student debt. And um, all I had to do was order a T-shirt and stand in front of a live segment. I thought it was easy enough for $1,000. Um, easy enough to win the 5000 if I had just said that Bill Clinton was a rapist. I mean, there's no shortage of allegations. So, you know, I saw it as a kill two birds, one stone, express my political views and win some money at the same time. Yeah, and look at that. A Trump supporter who goes out and tries to use the means of capitalism to pay off a student debt instead of looking to the government or a candidate for president to just magically erase it now you went and you tried this on abc you tried it on fox and friends and then the most recent one nbc and this is where the lawsuit begins and this is where richard luthman enters the picture they roughed you up tell me exactly what was the experience when they found you getting your sign on their set i didn't have a sign i had a, a t-shirt that uh condoned the bill clinton um, iconic picture and the word rapist underneath. Um, I was in the audience just talking with uh, some old ladies about my uh, dogs. And out of nowhere, I felt a grasp on my left upper arm, my bicep area, and uh, the back of my uh, left neck. And I was told to please come with them. And they, you know, they rather forcibly uh, removed me from where I was standing. So you didn't even have a sign and you had your shirt on. And my understanding is you still had your shirt on top of it buttoned up. Yeah, I had a hoodie on on top of that white shirt right there, um, still buttoned up. So that way you can possibly just see his hair. You know, it wasn't buttoned down any further than that. So you think that they knew who you were because of similar protests you've done and targeted you specifically. And then do you think they were even perhaps more physical? And, and Richard, you can comment on this, too, more physical with you because of your past and because you like Donald Trump? Um, I do think that they uh, knew me because of what I had accomplished the day before with Good, Mor uh, Good Morning America, um, which, by the way, only had to tell me to step back 10 feet out of camera range. They didn't even lay a hand on me, um, and I complied with them. But um, The video is on YouTube from Good Morning America. It's clearly visible that the uh, security force and even uh, NYPD officers act like gentlemen, and Mark acted like a gentleman. He was there. They came up to him. They said, uh, could you please move? He said, sure. And he took a step back out of camera range. He was respectful. They didn't lay their hands on him. It was the regular discourse that you expect in society, civilized society. But in NBC, you had a pack of goons. These guys came over. They manhandled him. They put their hands on him, the first two. 
Then it becomes a scrum. Two, two and three more, it was probably four or five from, from, from Mark's recollection that were huddled around him, that rush him from uh, the front by uh, the barricade all the way outside of the 30 Rock property onto the, the, the street, and they get struck by a car. Then when the car comes and knocks them all over, then he gets hit in the back of the head with a radio. He gets hit in the back of the head with a knee. He gets roughed up. And then they have NYPD, we believe to be counterterrorism, playing clothes. And they said, do we have to tase you? Do we have to tase you? To which Mark says, what, what, what's going on? I, I, I'm giving myself up. I'm not trying to do anything. What, what, I got jumped by these goons. You know, this is something that you would never expect. He, he didn't do anything to uh, violent to provoke this. He was just targeted because he's a Donald Trump supporter. Yeah, and this is obviously a message that NBC doesn't want to get out there. I, I would imagine that's because perhaps somebody is more leaning towards Hillary at the top of that organization, but that's another conversation for another day. Now, I'm seeing that there are sums north of $50 million that could be on the back end of this lawsuit. I'm sure that the NBC goons and whoever sent them after you uh, were not expecting you to litigate. What type of claims exactly are we looking at here? Well, this is very clear assault and battery. They should never have put his hand, their hands on him. But more so than that, it looks like this is the culture of the goon squad that you have here. These are the same goons that, that service uh, Alec Baldwin and all the other crazy liberals up there at, at 30 Rock, and they think they can get away with impunity. So we think that it's the high ups there. It's a policy uh, as of uh, NBC Universal, as, who manages the property, and Tishman Spy, who manages the property, and, and uh, NBC Universal with the Today Show, and also the property owner themselves. They all have liability. They have a vicarious liability, concerted action liability. Uh, for the actions of these goons. It doesn't look like there was any protocol in place. It was a free-for-all. Where else in civilized society you have it where five guys can scrum up against a 23-year-old social worker who works with special needs kids. He wasn't doing anything other than talking to two nice ladies from Louisiana about their dogs. And then they cause all this harm to him. They bring him in there. They manhandle him. They take one of those radios and they smack him in the back of the head with it. This is, this, is, uh, 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 this is outrageous. And so the punitive damages are based on the outrageous conduct of, of NBC Universal, of Tishman Spire, the property manager, and of the property owner themselves. Beyond that, NBC Universal has a, uh, insofar as they're a news gathering outlet, they, have a, a, they, they stand behind First Amendment protections all the time. They say they, they can news gather and, and uh, they're, uh, they have a, a right, a uh, freedom of the press. Yet they're trying to take my client's First Amendment rights and stifle them. And yet he didn't even make any First Amendment expression to that point. They just had him on the list. He was on the list of deplorables, for lack of a better term. And he was one of the people that they think might go in there and do something. So we better stop him before he comes. This is like SS tactics. This is something that we don't see in America. This is disgusting. And this is how NBC operates. My client needs to be made whole. And NBC needs to be taught a lesson. And, you know, I'm curious, uh, this is a question for you, Richard, it, you know, what are the realms of maybe this being a hate crime? I mean, if they're targeting him because he's a Trump supporter, I mean, are, is that a possibility here? That's something that could be the case. That would be a, a situation for the, the, the New York District Attorney to look at, Cyrus Vance. I'll tell you, if I put a complaint into Cyrus Vance's office, it'll be at the bottom of a stack, and it'll never get anywhere because he's a, a known Democratic uh, operative, basically. He's a long-time long Democrat. He's a long for a long-time family. So you don't bark up that tree. The only way to punish these people is to use the, the tort laws, the civil laws of this country, to teach them a lesson. And the best way to teach them a lesson is in their pocketbook. Yes, my client was, was injured, and yes, my client needs to be made whole, but they need to be taught more of a lesson. Because we entrust uh, the, the news outlets to report fairly and, and, and to accurately, and, and they're going to sway this election that's within the next week. And they're going to put things out there. And at the same time, they want to regulate what expression can be made, what political speech can be made. And, and in so doing, cause violence and put their hands on my guy who's done nothing other than stand there and act like a gentleman. And the Good Morning America appearance is, is proof positive. Yeah, and just to be clear, you know, Mark, you'd been going around, you'd done this before, you've dealt with ABC staff, Fox staff, and whatever security detail that they might have. 
And outside of the realms of a political debate here, whether, you know, nonpartisan here, we're just talking about free speech and, and how that's treated in our society, where for whatever reason, NBC felt the need to, to basically beat the crap out of you and then shove you over to the New York Police Department. This is a stand for the First Amendment right, I think, that you guys are taking as well. Yes, it is. You know, it's, it's an amendment that you know the forefathers put in there for a reason. Everyone should have it because uh, everyone should have their answer. Like if Susan Sarandon showed up with a Jill Stein sign, I doubt that she would have been treated this way. That's and that's the point. In, in a in a regular place where, where people go every day and they're allowed to go and congregate and uh, with a business invitees, which is the legal term, when they're allowed to be there, this is is outrageous that this could happen. You know. Just also for a second, the, the guy in the, um, I believe it was the English postings of the Daily News, um, he was holding up an actual Bill Clinton as a rapist sign. I only had on a t-shirt. I wasn't uh, publicly expressing it. Um, so I, I was wondering what happened to that gentleman. Was he mistreated or was he just asked to leave or did they just let him be? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. There's actually a lot of the Bill Clinton rapist protesters out there that we've seen, you know, Fox staff actually dra uh, drag them away. And we uh, I don't know if we ever heard from them. And it's funny. I bet if you had a Trump as a rapist sign, the reaction would have been a little different. Now, um, I want to right. I want to take this in a different direction here. Now, um, Richard, you've actually done a lot of political activism. You're a Democrat for Trump. And I'm just curious. There's a story here where you're going to deal with one lawyer who likes to play uh, in the mud and um, put absurd documents and lawsuits on your desk. You're going to go Game of Thrones style on him. I'm curious, are you going to use that same tactic maybe to deal with these NBC staffers? You know what? Uh, it, it might be the way to go because the whole basis of that case was we have a, a, a constitution. Uh, we have constitution, a federal constitution with rights reserved to the people. We have a state constitution in New York. Uh, that harkens back to the British magistrates and their ability to resolve cases and controversies before them. And what was on the books in 1774 and 1776 was the ability of trial by combat for a judge to be able to sanction a, a duel. So, you know, that goes back to what we had in the, in, the, in, in the Declaration, our sacred honor. That was why those great men came together uh, to defend their sacred honor. They pledged their sacred honor. And if you can't defend your honor in America, it's no longer longer America. So that's something that I, uh, that, that may be on the table because it's something that's available under the law of the state of New York. But a lot of these people that legislate for the bench would never uh, want to admit. You know, we talked about the outrage from Haitians regarding the pilfering of their country, the corruption of the Clinton Foundation. After the natural disasters in 2010, the earthquakes and then the more recent hurricane situation, that's important that we look at that, and it's important that we see that pattern of corruption. But we're going to talk to our guest now, who's going to give us a much broader look at what's been happening in Haiti. She's been working since 1994 against the neocolonialism, the neocons, as well as the progressive liberals in this country, the Obamas and the Clintons. And what we're seeing there is a pattern of operation, a method of operation that we see the globalist cabals doing everywhere throughout the world, and they're going to be doing it here. And we can already see evidence of the beginnings of these tactics, the police state, the UN involvement in their country. We can already see that beginning here in the United States. So I want to talk to Ezali Doktaw. She's a human rights lawyer. She's with the, uh, actually, president and founder of the Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network. Aisley, as I just said, most Americans don't think about Haiti until we see a natural disaster. But there's been a man-made disaster that you've been working against now for decades. And just like uh, with Danny Williams' situation, a lot of people will say, hey, uh, why are you doing this now, getting involved in the election? But it's an opportunity for you to draw attention to the problems that are in Haiti. And, of course, these are problems that we're seeing here in America. I want you to talk about the not only the American government, but also the way the U.N. is operating in Haiti. and. As we were talking earlier, you pointed out that the U.S. has spent billions to set up a massive U.S. embassy in Haiti. The U.S. government thinks that Haiti is very important. Why do they think it's so important? How big is that embassy that they've set up there? Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the question because we have sort of been the outsiders who both the liberal media and the neocon media has essentially mar marginalized our voice. And I have three questions I'm always trying to get out there for Americans to pay attention to a narrative that's different than what the, um, they're going to read on New York Times, Miami Herald, or Washington Post, um, or 
AP and Reuters. So my questions that I always ask Americans and world citizens and Haitians to ask is why would the United States build its largest embassy in the Western Hemisphere in tiny Haiti if we have no resources? Mm -hmm. Why would it build an embassy who is now because of the, the drawdown of military out of Iraq is the fourth largest embassy of the United States in the world wow. after China, Germany, Afghanistan, um, Haiti. And so that so speaks to a couple of different issues. That, that speaks to the, the wealth of the natural resources there. And, of course, U.S. policy, which is built on exploiting that wealth in other countries. Talk about the natural resources that Haiti has, for example. Haitian geologists say, and I'm so happy you're giving us the opportunity, and it's very ironic, as you said. I mean, it would be humorous if it wasn't so deadly that it's the, the candidate who is labeled as the only racist in the game um, that has given us the opportunity to, to have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, Haitian geologists say that Venezuelan oil is a cup of water to Haiti's Olympic pool. Wow. wow. They say Haiti has more gold than any place else in the Western Hemisphere. They say that Dominican Republic, which shares the island with us, has $33 billion worth of gold. And so if Haiti, and, and they have had Barrick gold in there, um, there is, of course, media silence with regards to the destruction of the water and all that in the Dominican Republic. But they want to bring gold mining to Haiti, which has never had uh, gold mining since Columbus discovered it and the New World started. Um, and so if the Dominican Republic has 31 billion, imagine how much Haiti has. And it hasn't had 10, 20 years of gold mining like the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic says they still have 31 billion. So we have important natural resources that the Haitian people have um, basically uh, uh, been in trust of and taken care of. But now, um, the, what you guys give the name to globalists, we call it the duopoly, the U.S. duopoly, along with the U.N. Security Council, um, or everyone is in Haiti. It's a total international crime scene. And we it's important that we understand how the U.S., especially the Clintons, are tied in with the U.N. When we look at the natural resources that are there, the massive natural resources, of course, there's also things like iridium that they believe uh, are in Haiti. It's estimated by some that there's about $10 trillion worth of natural resources in Haiti. That would be about $10 million per Haitian that are there. And yet, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's because of the exploitation. We saw this in Libya, where Hillary and Obama went in and deposed Gaddafi. Why? Because he had a lot of oil. He had massive water resources. Uh, in Africa, in uh, the, the Saharan area. Uh, amazing natural resources there, but also a political challenge to the established order, to the globalist bankers, because he was setting up a gold-backed currency there. Let's talk about the connection between the UN and the Clintons, okay? Uh, there's a police state uh, pressure there that is part of the UN. I want to talk about that as well. But first, let's talk about Bill Clinton. I know that you and others, your, your organization, the Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network and other organizations there, sued Bill Clinton over the misappropriation of funds. How did he respond? Yes. Um, two lawyers, um, uh, Andre and Newton St. Juice in Haiti, sued um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton and Max Bell Reeve, who were co-head of what something is called the Interim Haiti Reconstruct Recovery Commission, and said, what happened to the $10 billion that was uh, raised at the UN in the name of the Haitian victims? And Bill Clinton said, I have UN immunity. You can't ask me any questions. <laughs> That's amazing. UN immunity. That's yeah. what Bill Clinton says, okay? That's what Bill Clinton said. To <laughs> of course, Haitian. they've had uh, Justice Department immunity here in the U.S., but and when they go to another country, the Clintons uh, yeah. say they have U.N. So immunity. All the U.N. has to do is name Bill Clinton U.N. special envoy to Haiti, and then he can come in and do whatever he wants, um, cover up cholera, cover up taking our resources. Basically, what un folks have to understand is that the media manages your perception. 
no more in Haiti than any other place in the world. Yes. So I just told you all the things that the media and especially think about it. The, the, the so-called liberal leftist media who tells you some bad things about the neocons and how they're bigots. But yet I can tell you that after the earthquake, what Barack Hussein Obama did to Haiti is so shameful. He essentially gifted the Clintons, husband and wife, to get them out of his hair during his eight-year term my country, Haiti, the, 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 the land I was born in. Wow. I was raised in America, um, became a lawyer in America, but I went back with the first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. So the United States, the Bush dynasty, took down the democratically elected president of Haiti twice in 1991, CIA backed, and then in, in, in 2004, CIA backed. As a matter of fact, in 2004, the U.S. Special Forces just put uh, Aristide on a rendition plane. And how did they replace him? In 2010, Bill Clinton was at the UN as UN Special Envoy, and we certainly didn't have anything to do with it because you, Bill Clinton, all he did when he brought Aristide back was re-image another Kosovo type of issue. He re-imaged the death squads as civil society and gave the NGOs this, the PR of the NGOs as benevolent. But essentially, he forced Aristide, and that really made Aristide be disliked by a great number of people. Um, he forced him to put in a regime of neoliberal economics, which to your audience, I, I say, is when public assets are privatized to the global elite. So they privatized all of Haiti's resources to folks like uh, 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 the, 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 the folks that are giving money to the Clinton Foundation because the Clinton mm -hmm. Foundation essentially is a money laundering scheme. It's the way, they, you know, they talk about Mr. Uh, Trump not paying taxes, but Mr. Trump says he doesn't pay taxes through a legal loophole. Yeah. Well, the way the Trumps don't, I mean, the, 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 the Clintons don't do it is through their foundation. Yeah. They pay their living expenses. They pay their, their, flying expenses everywhere, um, don't pay any taxes. They said at the UN, they raised $10 billion. That's um, Mr. Uh, Bill Clinton um, was in charge of that at the UN and they had the World Bank as the depositor. During a recent campaign stop in Florida, Donald Trump told a group of evangelicals that he thinks the only way that he could get to heaven is by becoming president of the United States. This will be an election that will go down in the history books and for the evangelicals, for the Christians, for the everybody, for everybody of religion, this will be may be the most important election that our country's ever had. So go out and spread the word. And once I get in, I will do my thing that I do very well. And I figure it's probably maybe the only way I'm going to get to heaven. So I better do a good job. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, radio talk show host and author, Pastor Carl Gallops joins us now. And I wanted to get your comments on what Donald Trump said right there, that his best chance to get to heaven is by becoming president. You and I both know that that's not true, but I think it really shows the mindset of Donald Trump and where his heart is, because he really wants to do what's best for all of us and what is best for the country. What do you think? Right. No, I agree with you, Darren. As a matter of fact, of course, I think he was just being humorous. But I think what he was saying was, based upon the context, was that he understood that the Lord himself was watching him, <laughs> that he had to keep his promises. He had to be truthful. He had to be integrity filled. He had to be the leader he was promising to be. Because truly, one of the platforms of, of, of his whole campaign is to be a person who would give um, really people of all faiths, but but especially evangelical Christians who've been under the uh, the the uh, targeted uh, uh, focus of the of the current 
regime. I think what he was saying is one of one of his big platforms is, look, I'm going to give evangelicals some breathing room, you know, because I, I can't, you know, I am one of you. And so I think that's what he meant, and that's what he was saying, that, look, he, if he was truly saved, if he was truly going to have the blessings of God, he was going to have to do what he promised to do. And I think that's what he was telling the folks there. Well, I agree with you. And, and it was you once said that Donald Trump can be best judged by his enemies. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've written to this. I've spoken to it several times. I don't remember the whole list, but I made a list one time of about 20 uh, people or organizations, major national, international, geopolitical organizations that hate him. And um, I, I just looked at that list. And I said, oh, my gosh, I want to be on the opposite side of that list. So if these are the people that hate Donald Trump, if these are the people that desperately do not want Donald Trump to be president, then I want to be standing with Donald Trump. Because it was, you know, of course, it's like ISIS, it's the terrorists, it's the, it's the illegals bur burst, breaking down our borders, it's the anti-borders people, it's the ultra-left, it's the communists, it's the socialists. And at the time I made that statement, there were, there were uh, international leaders uh, it, coming out in mainstream media trashing Donald Trump, basically letting it be known that they did not want him in office. What does this tell you if these are the people that are, are, are desperately terrified of the Donald Trump presidency, then this proves more than anything else we need this man in the White House. Well, the bottom line is that Donald Trump scares the you-know-what out of the establishment. And it was former yeah. sp Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who said that Donald Trump is a man who cannot be controlled and manipulated. Why? Because he doesn't belong to the secret societies. Uh, and now they're faced with a very real prospect of Donald Trump becoming the leader of the party, and it absolutely drives them crazy. Uh, they just cannot Why? imagine sharing. Well, because he's an outsider. He's not them. He's not part of the club. He's uncontrollable. Uh, you know, he hasn't been through the initiation rights. He didn't belong to the secret society. So Trump's policy platform is, is not only a major threat to the globalist agenda, but this is a major, major threat to the American left as well. And I think we all need to pray for Donald Trump because I, I, I bet you agree with me, his life is probably in danger, don't you think? Oh, es yes, especially, especially once he becomes president of the United States. I do agree with you, and I have made that statement before publicly, so yes, I do agree with you. And let me say, Darren, I've given this illustration that I'm getting ready to give your audience. I've given it on international television, radio, on my program, and every time I do, people say, oh, I get it. It clicks because it, it illustrates the truth that you just spoke about how the globalists hate him, the establishment elite, the political establishment in Washington hates him. And the question people ask is, why? Why is that? Why is it that there are so many people in Washington with an R beside their name? We get it why the, why the pure globalists hate him. We get it why the progressive leftists hate him. We get it why the people with D's by their name say they don't want him in office. But what is it with these guys that have an R by their name that are attacking him and trashing him and never Trumpers and all of this? This, this confuses people. And here's the answer. I take you to the Middle East for my illustration. In the Middle East, the predominant religion is Islam. They are divided into two predominant denominations, Sunnis and Shia. Of course, the Shiites and the Sunnis have some doctrinal differences, but they're relatively minor. They wouldn't say that, but looking at it from the outside, they're relatively minor doctrinal differences. But the biggest thing between the Shiites and the Sunnis, they war against each other. They butcher and destroy and slaughter each other continually, and they have for hundreds of years, over who is going to control the caliphate, who's going to control the Islamic world, the utopia they're trying to create. Who is going to be in charge? So they all agree they're Islam, but they're all of the same religion, and they're all looking for the Mahdi, their, their Messiah, to come. But what they're killing each other over is who's going to be in power? Who's going to have the control? And I say, now come back to Washington. Here's the understanding. The Democrats and the Republicans, the establishment elite, they are globalist. 
thoroughly through and through globalists. They don't give a rip about Americana, about the Constitution of the United States, about rule of law. How much of that have we seen? They want to rule their utopian one world order that they've been working on for decades and decades, and now they can taste it. They're so close. But along comes Donald Trump, who threatens to set their agenda back by 50 years if he goes in office. And he's calling them out. And that's what this is all about. No, you're absolutely right. And I think this is this is our last chance to save the republic. So what do you say to the Christians out there who are undecided voters or that have already decided not to vote for Donald Trump because he's not the picture perfect Christian in their minds? We've never had a picture perfect Christian. We've never had a perfect candidate. We're not voting for a priest. We're not voting for a pastor. We're not of the Pope. We're voting for the commander in chief and the CEO of our borders and our economy. This is what we're voting for. The bottom line is on November the 9th, all things being equal, and we know what's going to happen with all the Hillary scandal, but on November the 9th, it's either going to be Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, a globalist or a nationalist. I know people say, well, Donald Trump's an entertainer. Well, that's what they said about Ronald Reagan. That's right. You know, Donald Trump doesn't have that much experience. Well, that's what they said about Ronald Reagan. And I'm not saying he's a new Ronald Reagan. He may prove to be better than Ronald Reagan. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But all I know is this. I don't think he's the savior of America. I don't put my faith and trust in one man. But in the human realm, in the spiritual realm, we have a choice between Trump or Clinton. And if Christians stay home because they haven't found their perfect candidate in Donald Trump, then they are, in effect, voting for Hillary Clinton. And if Hillary Clinton goes in office, what are they going to tell? What are those Christians going to tell their children and their grandchildren when the world they grow up in is absolutely destroyed? And you say, well, I stayed home because of my conscience. I'm saying to Christians, get out there, be the salt, be the light, get engaged and vote and help to put this man in office. I'm just voting for some breathing room so the church can be the church. Under Hillary Clinton, we know what will happen. Under Hillary Clinton, the, the, the country is done. It would be the most corrupt administration in history from the very beginning. So we know what to expect from Hillary Clinton. Yes. All right, real quick, I want to uh, tell people where they can find your books, how they follow you on the Internet, and how do they listen to Freedom Friday radio show on the Gulf Coast? Thank you so much. The quickest and easiest way for all of that, Darren, is carlgallops.com, carlgallops.com. My books are anywhere good books are sold, books a million, Barnes & Noble, amazon.com. My latest book, When the Lion Roars, is already a number one bestseller on Amazon in several categories, and uh, God's really using it. Thank you, Darren. All right, thanks for being here. Recently, we showed you just how electronic voting machines can be programmed to manipulate the outcome of an election. Well, Beth Harris's theory is playing out in real time here in Texas. Dr. Laura Presley has been working tirelessly to expose what's going on and help to maintain the integrity of the elections here in Texas. She's collected actual legal evidence connecting the dots between Bev Harris's work and what's playing out in the Texas election. Uh, we were the first case in Texas legal case citing backup records are not being saved for election uh, cases in Texas especially for recounts we I was a candidate in Texas and we did we didn't believe the electronic results because we had polls that showed us um, at much higher percentages than what came in on election night with the electronic voting so we filed a recount and what we found were that Travis County and Austin Texas were not keeping the legally required backup records ballot images and results tapes that document what each candidate got uh, on the election night uh, before the equipment leaves the building and goes down to the county. And so we worked with Bev Harris for about the last year and a half and asked her to look into her software and say, do you actually show storage of real ballot, legal ballot images? And that was the beginning of us working with her. And so when she came back and says, yes, the equipment is storing real ballot images, but they're not matching up with the results. So our case is actually, it's wonderful because I think we are evidence of what she's proposing and theorizing. So it's, it's very important. These ballot images are very critical because they store the image of the ballot right after the voter picks who they want to vote for. And even the Hart InterCivic patents say that it stores a real cast ballot image, a replica exact copy of the ballot. 
So those are really important. So we've worked here in Texas. Uh, we know that there's issues with the main computers. Our case got evidence of corruption errors at the main computer. So you're supposed to have two backup records, paper backup. The state of Texas doesn't have that. And then you have corruption errors of the tabulation. So that's very consistent with what she's theorizing, proposing. And so you're talking about the difference between a ballot image and a cast voter record. What's the difference? You know, what does our Texas Constitution say? Absolutely. The Texas Constitution requires that the ballot have a serial number. And if you think about that, it makes a lot of sense because you want to be able to track and trace every single ballot. Well, even electronic ballots have to have a serial number. And what we found was what was being produced to counties all across the state of Texas are records that are computer records, not an image of the ballot. The cast vote record is a data structure printed one per page for what the computer, the main computer that's corrupted in our case, says that you voted instead of the original legal ballot image that has a serial number on it. So the Texas Constitution requires that. And Keith Ingram, uh, the Secretary of State's office here in Texas, has waived all of these records for the state. He has taken the position that we don't have to have a real legal ballot image for a recount, and that violates state law. He says we don't have to print a results tape at the end of early voting and the end of election day, and that violates state law. There's certain chapters of the election code. And so what do you have? You just have, just trust the computer, Leanne. Don't worry. Go back to sleep. Don't. You know, just trust the computer. So we have done a lot of work politically, uh, grassroots level, and state legislators here have, have got on board. There's a state senator, Senator Bob Hall, who has an electrical engineering degree, so he understands all this computer stuff because it's complex. You know, we've really abdicated our responsibility to a machine, and we're, we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So people have stepped up across Texas. I've given 110 presentations across the state in the last year, educating grassroots, clubs, political clubs, retirees, anybody that'll, that'll listen about what records are not being stored. So we have, we've done a lot of work. We've asked uh, Governor Abbott to please step in and rescind all these waivers that have been put out by the Secretary of State's office because we want honest and fair elections in Texas. And we've been, we've been met with um, really no action for the last six months. We've been working very hard on this in the last six months. We've done political pressure. We've, we've put um, grassroots um, effort so that the governor understands this is important to everybody. Right. Yeah. Well, is this something that, you know, just for for voters out there, is this something that would matter, say, in a landslide election, or is this more um, for when it's that really close, tight race? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, computers can be programmed to do whatever you want. It can it can handle a landslide, actually. But if the public opinion is out there and you you see what the public um, thinks, it's it's harder to steal it. And I agree with Alex Jones on that. That you know it's easy to to press a button and, and put percentages like Bev Harris is is saying, you know push a button and we'll get these percentages. It's easy to do, but when the public is pressing and they want the backup records, it's a lot harder to do it. Tell us, you know, the election is just days away. What's next? Like, how can people protect the integrity of the election right now? Yeah, and there's a lot we can do as, as citizens and as grassroots. You know, we had poll watchers at the main computer. That's one thing Texas allows, and it's just absolutely amazing, and it allows us to, to exercise our power. Poll watchers can be at those main computers, and we had poll watchers in about 13 counties across the state at the primary. And guess what? Corruption errors have been reported in Houston, Austin again, and Llano County, so the, all the range of size of counties from large, medium to small. So we really think it's critically important for this election in November that we have poll watchers at the main computers because you want to see if there's corruption errors, what's occurring, you, know, you want boots on the ground. So we are, um, we've organized poll watcher volunteers all across the state of Texas in the top 10 to 15 largest counties in the state. And we're asking Donald Trump, a poll watcher has to have a candidate assign them. So that's the state law. Yeah, and so, so we're all Donald Trump has yes. to do is <laughs> sign this right here. I know you've sent this. That's to the campaign. right. We have. We've sent it to the campaign. We've sent it through multiple channels. And we have volunteers waiting, no money, no expense to the campaign, to the Trump campaign. And we really need his signature to assign these watchers. 
And um, so it's, it's critical that we be there, we be boots on the ground, and we see and we gather evidence, we gather affidavits. Another issue we found in the primaries uh, in March was that the Secretary of State's office was asking poll watchers to leave and that they could not monitor the main computers. Mm. So that's another strike against the Secretary of State's office giving bad legal advice mm. to counties. So we're going to have uh, lawyers, we're going to have um, you know, very strong people at being these poll watchers that are not intimidated very easily. And we just need Mr. Trump's signature. Right here. And there's this. no charge to the campaign, and we're doing <laughs> it here, grassroots here in Texas. <laughs> and then so, you know, I, I see you've really been working on this, like, full throttle, giving everything to help the people here in the state of Texas, you know, ensure the integrity of our vote. Have you reached out at all to Crooked Keith Ingram's office? Well, Mr. Ingram, we have reached out to him, and just there's just no... There's no response. There's there's just absolutely no response. We he had given a waiver to uh, counties all across the state to not complete the post-election audits in March in the primary, and I talked to Mr. Ingram personally, and I said, I said, Mr. Ingram, why are you giving these waivers? And his response was, That's what we do. Hmm. And I said, Well, that's really not. Uh, a reason. Can you help me understand why you're giving waivers to 254 counties to not do the post-election audits? And he said, that's what we do. Right. So every every angle we've tried to approach him uh, has not worked. We've had state senators try to talk with his, his office. We have state reps try to speak with him, and nothing seems to change. And I want to bring up one thing. There was a state representative, Stephanie Click, who is a state rep in the near the Fort Worth area, and she says she participated. This she told me this personally. She participated in a recount and back in 2005 and she claims and she adamantly supports that she saw a real legal ballot image in a recount okay so it was there at some point we go back through and do the research on the certification documents for the electronic voting machines and it looks like in 2006 examiners were noting ballot images don't exist anymore Okay, so there was something that happened in 2006 where the real legal ballot images, the backup record to prove the electronic tabulation, were not being required for the, so for the uh, software of the equipment. So that is a big issue. So we are on this ballot image. You've got to have the ballot image. Bev Harris says that it's got to be there to document and prove the, the electronic tabulation. And we're, we're watching Texas like a hawk. It's our responsibility. We're stepping up and um, we're taking what's ours. Donald Trump, we need your signature. We want watchers at the polls. That does it for tonight's nightly news. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Thanks for your support at InfoWarsStore.com. We'll be back tomorrow night, Friday night, 7 p.m. Central, InfoWars.com slash show.